Welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. The following interview is designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. Your host, Derek Champagne, is the founder and CEO of The Artist Evolution, a full-service agency building successful brands, marketing tools, and campaigns, and also the author of the best-selling book, Don't Buy a Duck. And now, let's begin today's Leadership Series interview. Welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where our goal is to inspire you to become the best leader that you can be. Today in the studio, we have Steve Dorf. He is the author of the new book, I Wrote That One Too, A Life in Songwriting from Willie to Whitney. I'm honored to have him in the studio with us. He's one of the most successful songwriters and composers, composers of the last 25 years. He's penned over 20 top 10 hits for pop and country artists around the world, including Barbara Streisand, Celine Dion, Blake Shelton, Smokey Robinson, Kenny Rogers, Ray Charles, Ann Murray, Whitney Houston, George Strait, Dolly Parton, Judy Collins, Cher, Dusty Springfield, Ringo Starr, Garth Brooks, and more. He scored for television shows such as Growing Pains, Murphy Brown, Murder, She Wrote, Reba, and then several films such as Any Which Way But Loose. He has also embarked on a musical theater with the show Josephine for Broadway. Dorf has also been nominated for more than 40 BMI Awards, an American Music Award, the NSAI Songwriter of the Year Award, three Grammy and six Emmy nominations, 28 motion picture scores, 12 number one hits, and over 400 songs recorded by notable artists spanning from all genres. Steve, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. You're here in Northwest Arkansas. Is this your first time here? Yes. So tell us why you're here. Uh, Well, I came in for the uh, I'll Fly Away uh, Music Festival, which is happening all this weekend. I was invited to come in and... uh, do a show tomorrow night, 7.30 p.m. at the Haxon Studios in Bentonville. Yes. Okay. I, mm-hmm. I, I know the owner of that studio. It's a great spot. Um, why why is it important to you to do an event like this and to be part of, I know there's a whole songwriting workshops happening all weekend. Why is it important to you to be involved in something like this? Well, uh, I have a book out um, that I wrote that uh, came out uh in November, and it's my memoir, and so I'm kind of touring with that. I, I think what's important for songwriters like me, who are fairly anonymous, we're not the we're not the face of our songs. Nobody knows who we are. Right. I'm this Oz behind the curtain guy who has written the soundtrack to a lot of people's lives, and nobody has any idea who I am, which is fine. Um, you know, the face of the songs are the artists who make them famous, like Kenny Rogers or Barbara Streisand or Celine Dion or George Strait. Right. Um, so it's, uh, to answer your question, I do some of these festivals and, and performances to help educate people that there are people like me who just sit in lonely rooms and sit at the piano or at their guitar and, and write songs and dream about having great artists hmm. sing them. Let's talk, let's get right into the book. I've got it right here. Mm-hmm. I wrote that one too, A Life in Songwriting from Willie to Whitney. I, I love this book. Oh, thank you. One of the things I love about it is, is, is there name dropping? Yes, because you, you write for some of the biggest names ever in music, but you t- you share real experiences of of your childhood of, of of how alcohol affected it as a child. You you're forward. You talk about your son who, who you have. We're going to talk about today with a mm-hmm. memorial fund, which is, and, and you're just you're so open in, in even a chapter where you talk about uh, about love. I, lo- I fall in love again mm-hmm. and again and again and, again. <laughs> and I love that. Right. And I think about the great songwriters that when they're sitting there in their moments of of pain or joy, and they, their expression is to write. That's where the songs come from. Yeah. They, you know, they, uh, which is a f- very frequently asked question. Well, wh- what were you thinking about when you wrote, you know, so and so? And, and, uh, or what inspires you to write a song? And the, the truth for me, it's, it's always organic. It's always mm. comes from a place of experience, something that I've experienced, whether it be painful or joyful. Uh, that's where they come from. You talk about this old upright piano that you had for your first charted song, and you still have it in your house to this I day. Do. Mm-hmm. What does that symbolize for you? you? You wake up in the middle of the night, and you'll go write a song on that. Not really. <laughs> Sleep's <laughs> too important. Um, 
it's symbol. I, I rented that piano in college and uh, for $12 a month and uh, wrote some great songs on it. And it sits in my bedroom and it's probably terribly out of tune because I never play it because uh, I have a big Yamaha downstairs right. that I play. Um, but it, it does symbolize uh, uh, where I've come from and how, how far a journey it's been. You, uh, it was really interesting to me is you talk about at a very early age, how I remember snowball fight yes. and, and, and you're hearing music and you're composing in your head. Yeah. And, and I wondered, and my son, my son is, is about to turn seven and he, he looks at the world a little bit differently, mm -hmm. not sports, not the same things. What do you say to either somebody that looks at the world differently and, and maybe has been discouraged? Or what do you say to a parent of a child who looks at the world differently like, like you did? But you were really creating these things in your head and have gone on to these, do these amazing things as a result. Well, I, my parents did not um, understand it. They, they, they thought I was from outer space. You know, I, w I would be getting hit from all sides by balls of ice and uh, musicalizing the whole thing. And then I'd ask my friends or I'd ask my – I remember distinctly watching a Little League game and one of my friends hit a home run and I turned to my mom and I said, how did you hear that? <laughs> and she looked at me like, what did you say? And I, I said, well, how did you hear that? Because I was hearing a whole symphony as he was wow. rounding the bases. And I just assumed that everybody did that, right? Why right. would I not? Right. You know, everybody's seeing, everybody's hearing, everybody's touching and feeling. It's, it's a sense thing. And uh, so with my kids, I have four kids and um, all very different, uh, all very creative in their own ways. Uh, I have one in particular, my oldest daughter uh, does not um, uh, see the world the way my other three do. And uh, uh, But yeah, I just encourage them to follow their dream because huh. that's, that's what I did. I love it. Your book is, uh, you talk about the ups and downs. So there's there's failures, there's waiting, there's oh. there's uncredited things happening. It's, it's just, it's great because it shows a struggle and a journey. And so even though you've done these amazing things, uh, it was not always just something that was handed to no, you. It's a roller coaster. I, th I think any form of show business is, is, uh, or maybe even in any business, it's, uh, uh, there are tremendous highs in songwriting and tremendous lows, not much in between. Um, it's, uh, it's it's a tough business, as I think probably being an actor or an actress or a screenwriter, um, uh, it's uh, it's a lot of being at the right place at the right time. In my case, it's a lot of manifest destiny. Um, you know, wishing and uh, putting yourself, dreaming yourself into be accomplishing those things, and then all of a sudden they happen. You know, I, I'll follow that by saying I, I wanted to be shortstop for the New York Yankees and hit, hit a home run at a Yankee stadium, but all the manifest destiny in the world would not make that happen. <laughs> so, um, and you were persistent as well, though. Yeah, you, know, you had well, this amazing talent, but you also talk about persistence. Yeah, I think I think tenacity and 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 talent. Um, uh, a lot of T's. Too dumb to to know <laughs> to know any better. Um, yeah, I, I think it all goes towards uh, uh, having success. I, I think uh, persistence and and uh, um, and again putting yourself in in the right place uh, uh, to make things happen. If if you sit and wait for the phone to ring, this is not a business to be in. Right. You got to make that phone ring. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, there's so many moments in the book, and I don't, I'm not going to spoil them, but there's chapters like Reba and Ringo Starr. Uh -huh. And I mean, just there's so many, so many names of my heroes. One of my favorite stories, though, uh, and, and I'm actually going to uh, pull it up real quick from, I think it's chapter 13, Kenny Rogers, Through the Years, which uh -huh. is an iconic, amazing song. Well, thank you. And you had, uh, and, and here's, the chapter starts, every once in a while you finish a song and just have the undeniable feeling that you've written something important or special. It's one of the world's best feelings, and unfortunately, it doesn't happen often enough. But that happened to you on that occasion. It did. And to have, for whatever reason it happened, however they heard about the song, you have Lionel Richie mm -hmm. and Kenny Rogers both wanting to, to sing that song. Right. Kenny wins, Lionel produces. I, I, right. it's just, I love that chapter. I, mean, you know, I love how, two of my heroes. How do you plan that? 
you know, uh, the truth is, and a lot of people, a lot of people over the years, pardon the pun, um, have asked me, how long did it take you to write that song? And I always say 30 years. It took me wow. 30 years to, to get good enough to write that song. Uh, the truth is, it took me 12 minutes. Hmm. Um, uh, Marty came, Marty Panzer came over one night for dinner and opened an envelope as he often did and handed me a lyric, finished lyric. And I looked at it. And as I was reading it, I started hearing the tune in my head and I yelled into my wife and I said, how long before dinner? And she said, Oh, about 15 minutes. So I grabbed Marty and we went to the piano and we finished it. And, uh, uh, but I could not have done that if I hadn't had the 30 years before that of struggling for hours right. with certain songs or spending days trying to perfect a line of a song. And uh, um, it's craft, you know, it's, it's, it's learning your craft and learning how to do it. Uh, take shortcuts, uh, shorthand, um, and just, you know, eliminating all the stuff that you, all the mistakes that you make a, along the way. Hmm. Pure country. I remember early nineties being in 11th grade uh -huh. and I can tell you who I was with. I can tell you the emotions. I remember, I remember, uh, as a dusty, the character dusty. Yeah. Uh, I remember when, when, uh, I'll cross my heart came on and play and I watched it on the big screen. I remember the first time I heard that and all my friends do all, all musician buddies. Mm -hmm. And, uh, love that song. Oh, it thanks. takes me back to that moment of time. And, and just even when the montage of that, where he's playing it quietly and then it comes out on the, and then he's playing in front of an arena, just so powerful. Love that movie. Love that song. Played it with my daughter last week, showing her. I said, this guy's coming in. Oh, and and, and it's so cool. Uh, tell me about some of your other inspiration. Because, yes, it's a craft in 30 years, but you do write from your heart, too. Oh, yeah. I, uh, again, I think uh, all these songs come from uh, experiences I've experienced. And uh, uh, I Cross My Heart was uh, one of those songs that just kind of fell out one day. I was working with uh, my good buddy Eric Kaz, great <laughs> songwriter, and uh, we just sat down and started started goofing around on the piano and uh out came this song and uh it was a struggle getting you know it took that song took about eight years to you know that, that's the funny thing people <laughs> people hear these songs on the radio and have no idea what the journey is uh, b behind all these songs they all they're like kids themselves you know once they're right. born once they're written they're born and then the trip and the journey is to get them on the radio and and become hits and some some happen very quickly in the case of i uh i cross my heart uh that was recorded uh, uh the demo we did originally we heard it as a boys to men kind of song hmm. um and actually demoed it that way and got nowhere with it okay and then cut to about three years in and bet midler records wow. it yeah. and uh it went nowhere. It was not a great recording. Never came out. And then I got a call from a director of a movie that I was hired to do, Pure Country. Uh, Chris Kane, the director, called me one night and he said, you know, I'm still looking for that uh, quintessential love song uh, for the end of the movie. He said, do you have anything? I've listened to about 100 songs and I hate them all. And I said, you know, I've tried to write one, but I, I'm not coming up with anything. I, I said, you know, I've got this song that I think I, can, I can't write a better song for this spot hmm. than this older song. He said, well, play it for me. And I went over to his house and played him across my heart. And he said, that's it. <laughs> and, uh, and George did not love it when we played it for him. Wow. He, uh, he gave us, he gave us a bit of a, hard time about <laughs> recording it because it wasn't the kind of thing that he normally does. Okay. And I always tell artists and, and, and people in Nashville now that it's, it's, it's those out of the box, uh, uh, songs that have a little bit of a different spin on the ball, which most of mine do. Right. Uh, those are the ones that become career career songs for people certainly every which way but loose was that for eddie rabbit um and uh, uh and i like to think that 
uh, I crossed my heart it w- was that for George. Hmm. Uh, back to the book. I, I, this is a must read. It, I, I've really enjoyed it. I goosebumps reading it. Again, being living in LA for a little while, I recognize some of the the studios, the roads you were talking about. Right. It just brought it very, very real. But the the whole style that it's written, it's it's just it's a nice roller coaster. It's just fun to go through the journey with you. But you had to live it. It's yeah. a lot easier for us to go and read through it this way. How, how cool! Yeah. What what a journey you've had. What with everything that you've had. I mean, you've, I mean, there's there's so many things that you've done. You're so successful. F- more than 40 BMI awards, American Music Awards, uh, three Grammys uh, and six Emmy nominations. And it goes on and on. 28 motion picture scores, 12 number one hits, over 400 songs recorded by notable artists spanning all genres. What motivates you and what does success look for you now that you've done all of these things? Well... You know, the, the answer to the first part is I, I, I'm so, still so passionate about music and I love writing songs. I, it's all, you know, I can't hang a picture on the wall straight. So it was all I was ever meant to do, I think, in this, in this life. And, uh, um, and I still, I still love it. I, I mean, I hear people in conversations say something, buzzwords, and I go, hmm, that could be a title. And, uh, <laughs> and that's just how, how my brain works. Right. And uh, in terms of success, yeah, when you're going through it, when you're, when you're going through the life, there are struggles and ups and downs, and it's not all, it's not all fun. And uh, it's just life like everybody has. And uh, um for me, I think uh, having those bucket list things happen along the way uh, means success to me. And mm-hmm. certainly uh, the Songwriters Hall of Fame induction this June uh, is the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for, yeah. for any songwriter. I mean, when I was nominated, I thought, wow, uh, you know, this is... I'm not going to get in, but at least I made the ballot. And then when I got the call uh, that I was being inducted on the first ballot, it was just, it's still surreal to me. Yeah. It's, you know, because you look at the names in that Hall of Fame from Backrack and David to Irving Berlin to uh, Lennon and McCartney and uh, uh, to be just on the same wall as those hmm. guys is, uh, you know, that's... If nothing, if if I never get another song recorded, that's it. Yeah. And what I love about that, and it seems to me that this is who it happens to, is that's not why you started out. There's people that try to get into showbiz to be in showbiz for that. You got you just, from a young age, it's just you've been all about expressing all about and music, writing yeah. the music. Yeah. Yeah. And so. I think I think that, that is, it couldn't happen to a better person, more deserving, because you represent the, the purest form of the art. Mm. And, and I love it. And, and to me, music is and songwriting is one of the purest forms of storytelling mm-hmm. because it can pull on the emotions. It can take you back to a place in time. You can remember everything about it, the experience you had, the taste, the food, the, the weather, everything. And so I'm like, you brought me back with, with the uh, Cross My Heart song and, and so many others. And it's amazing that you can do that for so many people through – through songwriting that will live on forever. Anything else that, is there anything else right now on your bucket list or that is coming up or that you have yet to do that you're going, this is, this is something I've got to do next. Well, there are always voices I hear that I go, wow, what I love, uh, what I love Keith Urban to record one of my songs. Uh, um, uh, there's, or, 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 uh, you know, just great, great artists. You know, I love working with great artists. I'm, uh, I'm such a fan of, uh, of great voices and, and, um, uh, and I've been so blessed to have worked with so many amazing, talented artists, uh, that, yeah, that never, that never stops for me. Uh, I, I'll hear someone on the radio, Carrie Underwood or Kelly Clarkson and go, I gotta get I gotta get a song with one of those. So that yeah. that keeps you young. It keeps you uh, keeps you relevant. Keeps you involved. And that's uh, I can't see me doing anything else. Hmm. I love it. Look, I want to talk for a minute, and and I'm, to say sorry for your loss doesn't even close to cover it. But I do know that you want to honor your son's memory. Mm-hmm. And so, can we talk for just a minute about? about the memorial fund because i want to make sure that absolutely uh, uh, my son andrew dorf uh, was a incredible songwriter uh, lyricist uh, moved to nashville uh, lived there for 14 years struggled 
and then became one of the best and most beloved songwriters in that town. Hmm. Uh, he just celebrated his fifth number one with Rascal Flatts, uh, wow. a song called Yours If You Want It, yeah. and uh, wrote Save It For A Rainy Day by Kenny Chesney, hmm. uh, uh, Neon Light by Blake Shelton, uh, just, just a great writer and uh, tragically... Uh, um, a month after he wrote the foreword to my book, uh, had a tragic accident, and uh, we lost him. And um, so my son and I, Stephen Dorff, the actor, uh, have created the uh, Andrew Marshall Dorff Memorial Fund, which uh, benefits uh, child oncology at Vanderbilt Medical Center in Nashville. And also a uh, an endowment for a music scholarship at Belmont College in Nashville. Wow. So we're uh, we're going to do uh, we're going to do uh, annual events uh, in Nashville uh, concerts. The first one being uh, this October second at the Franklin Theater in mm. in Tennessee, Nashville. And uh, there'll be some great artists performing and raising money for uh, kids that need it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. We'll, sure. we'll, we'll put links out with that as well. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, you know, I, again, I want to be respectful of your time. I want to give another plug for the book. I wrote that one too, A Life in Songwriting from Willie to Whitney. Again, a pleasure to meet you. I, I, th every single chapter is awesome. Oh, and again, I, the, just the chapters themselves, Reba, the, 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 Ringo Starr. Yeah. One last question though. Is there anybody, is there anyone, I mean, I know there were probably a few, but who, who was the biggest, biggest artist maybe that you worked with that you were either starstruck by or that just... You could not believe you were in the moment because you've worked with all the A-listers. Yeah, it, it had it had to be Ringo because I was such a Beatles fan. Uh, mm. It wasn't necessarily the best song or the best record I've ever been associated with, but in terms of uh, a surreal moment of pushing the talk back button and saying, can you sing that again, Ringo? Um, <laughs> you know, and then saying... What did I just say? You know, and uh, with a lot of expletives. Um, yeah, that was uh, that had to be uh, once in a lifetime. I mean, certainly working with Barbara Streisand and uh, um, Kenny Rogers, and uh, you know, the, the Bill Medley of the Righteous Brothers was yeah. was I was idolized Bill. I idolized Tom Jones. Getting to do an album with Tom was uh, was insane. Um, uh, Anne Murray, uh, you know, she recorded eleven of my songs uh, wow. over over her career. Um, Celine, uh, it's just you know, I've been so blessed to have worked with some of the greatest voices in any generation so and you've done so much with movies too which we really didn't even touch on but but yeah. you know on your book if we, in the back we've got kenny rogers but we've got clint eastwood yeah and and, and i know burt reynolds as well and several others yeah. but that, that's incredible I, I like the uh the relationship with with snuff garrett throughout the book it's uh -huh. fun fun seeing that woven in <laughs> Can you tell me more, just a little bit more about dynamic there? I mean, it's, well, it's Snuff brought me to California, and he he um, he was a great record producer and uh, a very tough horse trader, as they say in, in the business. <laughs> um, uh, and as you can tell in the book, uh, there you know it's a double edged sword. He uh, you know uh, I learned uh, I learned a lot. I, I've I take some shots at snuff because of some of the, some of the pay your dues type things I had to right. deal with. Um, uh, but you know, at the end of the day, um, I have to thank him for, for opening a lot of doors and giving me the platform to, to shine and do what I do. Um, because without him, I would have had to take a different journey. I think that comes through in the book too. Uh -huh. it, it does, but I, but I, I do love that first call you get that Snuff had called you to call him back, and right. that first just that Hollywood experience of you yeah. had a charted song, but you're banging down doors, and I'm here, yeah, right, and and, and, and not getting and, the calls back yet. So that yeah, that's I, really cool to have that. I had a lot of doors slammed in my face, yeah. and uh, and he uh, he gave me my shot. He gave me the he got me to California, moved me out there, set me up. Uh, introduced me to uh, the studio scene 
uh, kind of threw me into it when I maybe wasn't really ready yet, but yeah. uh, forced me to be ready. And uh, so, yeah. Can, uh, let's talk about the singing bee. Because <laughs> <laughs> that brought that put you that did put you in front of the camera. Yeah, for the first time. That was. Yeah. Uh, I got. A, I was. I, I remember. Uh, pl- I was. I was playing golf one day uh, with a friend, and I got a call from my agent, and I. Uh, I saw she was calling, and I. I didn't take the call because I was playing golf, and the phone kept ringing. And so finally, I. I called her back. I said, "What is it?" <laughs> she said, "There's this, you know, producer. This is a show. They want you to do it. It's called the Singing Bee." I go, what is that? She says, well, it's kind of a reality game show. And I said, Cheryl, I, I'm not going to do a game show. And I hung up on her. Hmm. And um, and she kept calling me back. And she said, take a meeting with this guy. And uh, and and so I I did. And uh, and I walked in, and he was reading my resume and and saying. And, and the first thing he said to me when I walked in, we shook hands. He said, nice to see you, Steve. He says, you know, I don't think you're really right for this for this uh, project. And I said, well, I don't either. So why, you know, let's just go to lunch and <laughs> what am I doing? Yeah. Here? Well, yeah. <laughs> and, um, but we had lunch and he was telling me about it and he said, you know, I, I think it would be a good thing for you. You'd be in front of the camera for a minute and, uh, you'd be kind of the Ed McMahon to, uh, uh, Melissa Peterman, yeah. Johnny Carson, you know, yeah. and, and, uh, it's great music and it'd be fun. And, and, uh, my kids actually talked me into doing it. They said, yeah, it'd be fun to see you on TV. So so we did it thinking uh, it's going to be 10 episodes. Hmm. And uh, it was a wheelbarrow of money. And uh, for me to do, uh, you know, basically uh, less than three weeks worth of work. Wow. And we ended up going five years. Wow. 50 episodes, five seasons. Uh, the number one rated show on CMT for all those years, and uh, and I made some great relationships and friendships, and uh, it was looking back, it was it was a lot of fun. Hmm. Lot of That's fun so cool. Day. I know I know that all your songs are your babies, but can you did two or three pop up at the top for you that that are most endearing to you? Probably ones that you never heard. That's a lo- great truth, answer. Truth be told, yeah. A song called. Um, uh, something bigger than me uh, hmm. that I wrote with Marty Panzer, uh, a song called "Fall Softer," which has not been recorded yet, uh, that I wrote with Kim Williams. Um, just pop into my head. Uh, oh, and a song um, called "Backyard Sky," which probably might be my favorite song I've wow. ever written, and. Uh, uh, it's about loss, and uh, uh, it's it's hard to play, uh, but and get through now because it's kind of taken on a whole new meaning. Um, I actually wrote it with uh, Tina Schaefer almost twenty years ago after she lost her brother, hmm. and uh, she wrote the lyric, and I I love I love what the lyric said, and uh, um, so those three pop into my mind. Are are you thinking that you might keep that one for yourself or is it, it or what does that look like? You know, or you I've, I've never really, that? never really pitched that song. It, it's a very personal yeah. song to me. Um, I don't know. I'd, I'd love for someone to do it. Obviously it's some, some point maybe, you know, the, the journey of songs is uh, boy, it's, it's all always about right time, right place, right artist, marriage between a song and an artist right. and a voice. It's, uh, um, and some of these uh, don't don't ever get the opportunity to, to be heard by the right artist because time goes by and you have new things and they have new things and and so it's really it's it's a matter of timing. You know, I I, I say in the book and it's a great analogy. Uh, most songwriters' catalogs are, are like icebergs. Um, you know, you see fifteen percent of an iceberg above water, hmm. and with a music catalog, when you've written two thousand songs. And and you maybe had you know twelve number ones. Uh, you know that's less than fifteen percent. Right. Is is above the water. Everything else uh, very rarely gets heard. Wow. So 
That's a good, great answer. I, I love that. Let, let's go back to a couple things in the book. Uh, not to get political, but Donald Trump's in the story for a few seconds. I love, I, I yeah, love that. Yeah, he is. Um, <laughs> he hit on my wife. What can I tell you? It, it's uh, And you won. It's old news. Um, <laughs> and you won. Yeah, my, my, uh, my second wife was... Uh, second ex-wife, was uh, a dancer, and she was doing a, a trade show in uh, at the Trump Casino in New Jersey. It was before we were married. Hmm. And Trump, uh, President Trump, sent, he wasn't the president then, obviously. This wow. was many years ago. Sent one of his guys over, one of his wingmen over, and uh, get that girl in the curly hair's number. And uh, invited her up to his suite, and uh, she ended up going up with... Uh, a bunch of her friends, which bummed him out. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of a, yeah, it, it's kind of a, that's funny you mentioned that. I forgot about that. I, I yeah. love it. Yeah. It, there's there's hundreds of, of, of things like that in this book that are weaved in with it. Well, it's kind of an anecdotal mm. um approach uh, you know a lot of the a lot of the things that are in the book uh, were were kind of second and third thoughts as, uh, once I turned the first draft in uh, my editor sent it back to me and said now we need more detail detail I want to know what I want to know what Celine was wearing I want to know uh, you right. know I want to know what Streisand said to you after you you know you reacted to her <laughs> performance um, uh, those kinds of details, which I didn't put in in the first draft, right. and it took me about three drafts to to get some of that stuff in, and then of course some of the stuff I had to pull out because I didn't want to get sued. Um, <laughs> so it's a, I think it's a nice combination of uh, of uh, stuff in there. It's a great balance. Yeah. Um, I like when you talk about you talk about meeting Bert Bacharach, who you were a fan of, and then you found out that he was awesome. idolized Bert. Yeah. Um, I mean, walk me through that to have someone like, I know Ringo Starr was that way, but for then him come back and say, I know who you are and I'm a big fan of, of what you're doing. Yeah, I was on an airplane and uh, it was back before 9-11, so there was no security. You could get to a plane, you know, literally 30 seconds before they closed the door <laughs> and uh, uh, and just walk on. Um, and I was sitting there and there was a seat next to me and uh, I thought, okay, this is going to be good. Um I can relax. I don't have to talk to anybody. And here I hear a little last second uh, noise up at the front. And uh, I see this guy, disgruntled guy. He's breathing heavy because he <laughs> thought he was going to miss his plane. And he's walking towards me and he's looking for a seat. And I'm thinking, oh, man, he's going to sit down next to me. And then I looked up again and it was Burt Backrack. And I went, <laughs> what? You know, and uh, he sat down. We ended up... Uh, uh, starting to talk and uh, uh, and he said what's your name and I told him my name and he knew a couple of my songs wow. and I, I was blown away you know and uh, yeah that's cool another another story about that you talk uh, where you actually made a connection with uh, with uh, recommending John Pagano to work together with him John Pagano yeah. Pagano and they worked together for over, over 20 years yeah well Bert uh, during our four hour flight it was from LA to Nashville actually he was going there to do a symphony date and uh, uh, he invited me to the show and I couldn't because I was in the studio that same night doing <laughs> something else and and uh, but uh, during the flight he's he, we were talking about arranging cuz he was my idol I a lot of what I incorporated into my style came from being a huge Burt Backrack fan wow. and uh, so I was asking him questions and then he said well let me ask you something he he, he said I'm I'm thinking about adding a guy uh to my group he he used he always used three girls as singers okay. and um he said uh how would you voice that and I, you know because i don't want to put him in the bottom and have two girls and i said no if, if he's got a good enough range i'd put him in the middle put one girl you know and i'm, I'm thinking to myself he's asking me how wow. to arrange voices i mean come on this is one of the greatest arrangers right. in modern times and um he said, do you happen to know a really good good singer? And, and I just worked with this demo singer, John Pagano, from Rhode Island, I, I, I believe he's from. And uh, great singer and a great guy. And 
I said, you ought to call this guy John Pagano. He's great. I don't think he's working that much. He'd probably love that gig, you know. And uh, John, every time I see him, he always thanks me for, um, he's been working for Bird, I think, for 23 wow. years now. Yeah. How 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 common is it in in your industry to help one another that way? I I think it's common. Yeah. I mean, when I'm asked, I, I'm asked often, you know, who, hey, who's a great female demo singer or who, you know, and I ask people sometimes right. because I want to get certain singers to uh, do my demos that that have a certain sound, and I don't keep up on all all the new young. Uh, you know, singers that right. a lot of the new writers are using. So, um, and every time I ask, I, I get a list or I'll get a number of someone. And it just happened actually a couple of weeks ago um, on, a, on a new song that, that I had just written that I was aiming to a particular artist. And uh, uh, I asked this songwriter friend of mine, hey, who would you use to sing this and he came up with the name and i used her and she was fantastic oh, so. that's a great break for them mm -hmm. too mm -hmm. you talked earlier about about life being highs and lows which i can relate to so much my question is in the lows what's what mindset do you what's what's the mindset to have to get back to the next high like what, what do you do during that time a lot of people get stuck in failure and the low points and have a hard time ever coming out of it your book is filled with highs and lows but you you've able to come out and, and have these big expressions in a big way and do these amazing things. I mean, it's a more accomplishments that a lot of people never do in their lifetime. How do you get through that? What's a mindset for our listeners if they're going through something? What do you do? It's a great question. Uh, I'm not sure I have a great answer. Um, uh, again, my, all I can relate to is my own experience. Yeah. I, I think uh, the a big low for me was... Uh, uh, going through a divorce, going through a very painful divorce where everything seemed to be out of sync. Uh, everything, right. everything in life was out of sync. You don't really realize it mm. while it's happening, but all of a sudden nothing is working. You know, you're not, the phone's not ringing. Uh, the songs are not quite good enough. Mm. Uh, the rewrites aren't quite good enough. Um, uh, the gears, the gears are just slipping in every f aspect of your life, it seems. And uh, right. all you can do is ride it out and and try to uh, and try to right the ship, um, which fortunately I was able to do. Uh, uh, when Andrew passed away, of course, being a being a parent, getting that phone call is uh, there. Really, are no words. Um, it's the most excruciating pain uh, a parent can ever feel. It's a club I wouldn't wish on anybody to be in. It's uh, the best I can explain it is that uh, just someone came and chopped my arm off. And uh, but you learn to live with one arm, and and uh, and and slowly you heal in certain ways. And uh, for me, the foundation was one way of uh, turning something somewhat positive right. to know that you can help other other people get through tough times. Right. Um, and then the writing started coming back. I, I wrote one song uh, in 2017, and it was not very good. Hmm. It was it was quite bad actually, and um, and I I just shut down and then uh and this year uh all of a sudden the hall of fame nomination came along uh right around christmas uh which was uh and I'll, i can tell this story because i can't make it up I, I received the phone call um telling me that i was being inducted almost to the minute of the phone call i of the worst phone call i ever received a year before Wow. And what that did was restore a lot of faith uh, because I know Andrew had something to do with me getting in. So, wow. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. Hey, again, thank you for coming by. We thank appreciate it. Thank you so it. much. Welcome yeah. to Northwest Arkansas. Thank you. And, uh, man, blessed to have you here and just excited that I got to meet you and then we get thank to share you. your story. This was really fun and, and you asked great questions. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. 
You've been listening to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. This interview was designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. 